let me then introduce this overall framework and then Sano can do a more uh, specific introduction to, to your talk. So uh, thank you very much to our guest speaker, to uh, Dr. Sunil Attain. But what I want to say to everyone here is first of all, welcome. Very glad you can join us. These Thursday afternoon speaker series uh, occur within the framework of our Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry here at McGill. Uh, and we have a variety of different speaker series that all uh, share the same time slot. Uh, we have ones for the division in general that are framed around clinical issues. We have a series called Culture and Community Mental Health, uh, which this year, uh, this semester, is uh, um, uh, occurring under the general theme of, uh, of uh, the uh, politics of the psyche. Uh, and then we have a series on global mental health. Uh, which this talk today is uh, squarely uh, fits under, relates to. And we also have a series on culture, mind, and brain, which uh, looks at the intersection of um, um, cultural processes and psychological processes and, and neurobiology. So those are the different sort of umbrellas or uh, under which we, we try to organize these talks, but it also depends a lot on uh, which of our colleagues are um, willing and able to uh, take part in these discussions and uh, what is uh, sort of useful to our community at a given point in time in, in terms of the evolution of our own uh, thinking. And so I'm very glad uh, that all of you can join us. And I will uh, turn the session over to Professor Vessier, who uh, has uh, kindly agreed to both organize the session, but kindly agreed to chair it. So, and I, again, I just want to ex uh, express my thanks to, uh, to Dr. Tame for being with us. Thank you, Lawrence. Hello, everyone. I'm Samuel Vessier. I'm co-director of the Culture, Mind, and Brain program. It gives me immense pleasure to be able to introduce our esteemed guest for today, Dr. Saini Nutain, who is a postdoctoral fellow at both UCLA uh, and Berkeley. We have been trying to plan this event for a very long time, and I've really been looking forward uh, to hearing this talk. Uh, I first had the honor of uh, listening to Saini Nutain talk uh, in, I believe it was in the the deserts of New Mexico, and then uh, later in the high plateaus of the Himalayas, and later again in air-conditioned hotels in, in California. Um, and I, I hope you, you won't mind my sharing this, uh, saying, you know, I hope it's not, I'm not revealing a secret, but I know you're, I know you're working on a book uh, based, uh, based on your ethnographic work. I uh, very much look forward to reading this book. So what I wanted to say, because I want to uh, give St. Inu the floor, is that, is that in my view, you know, I, I really consider you to be one of the last real anthropologists standing today because in addition to, <laughs> you know, because in addition to really, really deeply engaged in fine-grained ethnographic work, it seems to me that your work really touches on fundamental questions about the nature of human suffering, for example, some protective aspects of ritual, meaning, and narrative, uh, at the same time questioning some of the things we might take for granted based on what may be sort of narrow culture bound Western psychiatric canon. So, so in, in many ways, you know, you're, you're gifting us uh, uh, really broad and yet detailed anthropological perspectives on fun fundamental questions. And, and in my view, there's not very much current anthropological work that dares uh, to go into all these aspects of the human experience. So again, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, Happy to give you the floor and I very much look forward to the talk. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to mention in terms of logistics, um, I believe uh, uh, Dr. Tain will speak for about an hour, am I correct? Um, and so, and she has asked me uh, for people to, if they can, perhaps just jot down their, their questions and wait until the question and answer uh, se um, session slash section. Uh, in order to give floor to our speaker to, to present her ideas first. So I, I hope that's okay. But again, without further ado, uh, please welcome our guest for today, Dr. Saini Nutain. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Samuel. Really, really um, very kind um, and generous um, introduction um, and, and also very unexpected. I, I really wanna thank um, you for inviting me and encouraging me to um, come and present my work. Um, as well as Lawrence and everyone at McGill and in the CMB um, um, network. Um, I have been working on a book um, the last two years. This is the, um, the findings, the ethnographic findings that I'll share today is work that I've actually been doing with this community for the last seven years. And I, at the last two years, I've been writing the book um, and it's almost done. Um, the manuscript's almost finished, but um, it, I'm anticipating many, many more uh, revisions. And it's very easy to just, when you're 
writing to just kind of be caught up in all the details of that um, and not have um, discourse with your colleagues. I was, you know, I, I really appreciate you encouraging me to uh, come and present and share my ideas. Um, and this is, um, you know, I'm at a stage um, in my writing where I, I can use a lot of critical uh, feedback um, from my colleagues. Um, and so this is, this is a real treat for me because um, this is the space where I I write every day and I, and I, and I, you know, I go through the literature and now I haven't even, you know, I, I don't even have to get on a plane. Um, you know, I'm able to, to, you know, read, um, sort of, um, you know, uh, zoom into your, into your, your community and receive feedback. Um, so this, 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 this is a, a real pleasure for me and, and also very, very um, special. It's, it's a real treat for me. Um, so I'm new relatively new to Zoom. I've only been using it since the pandemic. So I understand now I'm supposed to share my screen. Um, so, so I think I'm supposed to make my PowerPoint into presenter view first. I'll do that. And then now I don't know if someone else can share the share the um share my screen or if i have to do it <laughs> have to do it at the bottom of your window you can choose share screen mm -hmm. um, um button at the bottom some... of your zoom okay. window you have to be in, back in zoom there you go that's it oh great okay um and then so now we see you on the right and we see your slide perfectly on the left okay great um, and I always like to, I'll, I'll end with my thank yous as well, but I always like to um, start with my thank yous. Um, so I'm going to be presenting um, on the Burmese democracy movement. Um, let me move this over. Um, oops. Usually clicking on the slide helps to advance it and uh, okay. the arrow keys don't always work, I find, in Zoom. But oh, anyway. okay. Okay. Um, um, so um, the, the discursive history um, of modern Burma um, has largely been um, a narrative um, of the Burmese military. Um, so the emphasis has been on um, the subjectivity um, of military actors, um, including their motivations, their agency, uh, their sense of power, control, and dominance. Um, military actors are um, portrayed generally as um, savage and violent. Um, they're also portrayed um, you know, somewhat paradoxically, paradoxically um, as being irrational, superstitious, and paranoid on the one hand, um, but also um, intentional, planful, uh, meticulous, and, and genocidal. Um, there's been very little academic work on the Burmese democracy movement and its many actors, um, and both popular and scholarly representations of the movement are, are dominated by um, three transnational discourses, um, that of human rights, um, humanitarianism, um, and the public health model um, of trauma. So uh, popular representations um, of the democracy movement um, and its community of political prisoners, including um, leaders such as Aung San Suu Kyi, um, have vacillated between portraying them as um, noble versus savage, uh, victims or perpetrators as being courageous or cowardly, um, and my fav favorite, um, as human rights heroes or as human rights uh, villains. Um, so really, what does this community uh, call themselves? So what they call themselves um, is Nanjin, uh, which is a colloquial term in Burmese and a shortened term um, of the word Nangaye Ejinda or Nangaye Ejindu, um, and it means political prisoner. Um, so the existing scholarship um, and popular representations of the democracy movement um, ignores the Nanjin's culture, psychology, and su um, subjectivity. Um, there are almost no accounts uh, which represent them as complex, whole, reflexive human beings um, that are embedded in an equally complex, whole, uh, reflexive culture and community. So there's no attempts to understand uh, their motivations or emotions. Uh, their sense of self, agency, um, identity, um, their capacity uh, for rational action, uh, their conscious and unconscious goals, uh, processes of meaning making, um, and their ideals uh, about what constitutes moral personhood. 
Um, so in this current uh, project, I'm going to move away uh, from the discourses of human rights, humanitarian aid, and this transnational uh, model of trauma, and instead use personal experience as the unit of analysis. Uh, this is based on a seven-year multi-site ethnography that I conducted with the Nigerian community, both in Burma and in the diaspora. Um, I conducted uh, both ethnographic and person-centered interviews with hundreds of Nigerian, uh, their families and supporters. Um, I also uh, participated in their everyday lives in both intimate and public settings. I would attend political rallies, uh, commemorations, court trials when they got arrested, um, accompanied them to uh, medical appointments, religious ceremonies, uh, their funerals, weddings, um, shared a lot of meals with them um, and did um, casual observation in the home. Um, I also um, attended organizational meetings when they would be planning activities of protest. Um, I traveled with them, um, collaborated with them on creative projects. Um, more than anything, however, I, what I did was I, I made an existential commitment um, to this community. So um, part of what, what I discuss um, in the book is that the key to understanding this community um, is not the contrast between noble versus savage, uh, victim versus perpetrator. Um, the key to understanding them is really understanding um, the very complex and dialogical interplay um, between the embodied and the imagined. So in terms of the social movement community um, of the Democracy Act uh, movement, um, the community um, is not bounded by territory. Uh, so you'll find Nanjin and their family in large urban centers. You'll find them in small cities, um, in rural villages. Um, you'll find a number of them on IDP camps. Um, I estimate that the core community, both in Burma and in the diaspora, is about 100,000. Um, and in Yangon, where I did most of my field work, um, there was probably about three to 5,000 community members who continuously had face-to-face -face and physical contact with one another. Um, this community in Burma is connected to the diaspora through social media and other internet technologies as well. Um, the social movement community of the democracy movement is ethnically, religiously, ideologically, um, and socioeconomically diverse. So in terms of ethnicity, you have democracy activists in Nanjin who are Burmese, Chin, Guyin, Kachin. You have many Burmese of South Asian descent. You have Rohingya, Shan, Chinese, Mun. Many are of mixed heritage. Um, likewise, in terms of religion, you have Buddhists, Christians, Muslims. There are some who are into Nat um, and spirit cults. Um, the vast majority um, are quite secular. They're secular intellectuals. Um, likewise, with, uh, in terms of ideology, uh, many Nanjin have very strong Marxist leanings, um, but many also embrace either wholly or partially uh, neoliberal economic principles. Um, some really don't have any uh, particular ideologies and vacillate between the two. Um, in terms of socioeconomic status, um, it's also a huge range. There, there's Nanjin from the urban centers where the student movement started, but there's also Nanjin who hail from rural villages, uh, relatively high levels of education and relatively low levels of education. Um, there's quite a lot of professional diversity. So you have um, individuals who were, um, who became political prisoners who were formerly doctors, attorneys, um, professors, but you also have um, Nanjin who were shopkeepers, taxi drivers, farmers, um, many, many Nanjin are, as I said, creative intellectuals. There are many artists, novelists, uh, poets, uh, musicians, many comedians. Um, they're also, um, so, so if they, so they're socioeconomically diverse uh, to begin with, but many did descend into poverty um, due to long imprisonments um, or, or political persecution. So they may have started off as a middle class a physician or attorney, uh, but after having been in prison for a number of years, they, they, the, the family uh, typically descended into poverty. And there's intermarriage um, you know, between activists across all these um, divides and um, constructed categories that are important to us. Um, so what, what binds them together? How can, how can I call, um, you know, given the great diversity um, of religion, of ethnicities, how can I really call them um, a single whole uh, community? Um, so what binds them together? 
um, is um, certainly a history of shared suffering, um, but also a shared understanding um, about the nature of that suffering. Um, so I'm going to um, reference um, a moral and relational concept. It's, it's known as a nitna, um, which means um, sacrifice in Burmese. And uh, what a nitna is this, is this um, sort of foundational um, moral and relational concept. Um, so as I said, uh, a nitna is um, a lay indigenous popular concept. Um, Melford Spira would have referenced it as sort of the fulcrum upon which the very complex ritual, moral, relational, and material life of the democracy activists rest. Um, it's a nitna is based um, on Theravadan Buddhist concepts, um, but for Burmese speakers, both in Burma and in the diaspora, the usage of the term transcends um, any particular religious tradition. So you hear this word all the time. Um, so a nitna has a you know very profound um, motivational salience for actors in the democracy movement. Um, and what Nina does is it offers Nanjin um, a distinct um, epistemological framework for understanding their suffering. Um, and it's an epistemological framework that really can be contrasted um, with other um, epistemologies that attempt to uh, explain human suffering, um, including uh, the transnational model of trauma. So you can really look uh, compares um, an indigenous concept like a nitna uh, with the transnational trauma trauma model um, and really regard them as really just very two distinct ways um, epistemologies really for understanding human suffering. Um, so just a just a word about the transnational trauma model. Um, over the last three decades, um, this this public health model of trauma um, has uh, become central to how societies make sense of suffering. Um, and the penetration of the transnational trauma model um, into people's moral um, and social worlds has been per pervasive. Um, indeed, it's difficult to remember a historical period um, when the terminology of trauma and of being traumatized um, was not referenced immediately in relation to human suffering. Um, so trauma survivors are viewed um, not only as preeminent witnesses to histor historical atrocities, um, but also um, as silent victims. So the silent victimhood um, of survivors and um, what's often regarded as, um, or what's often described as sort of the inexpressibility of uh, traumatic pain um, compel those um, in the fields of human rights and humanitarian psychiatry um, to bear witness on their behalf. Um, so the main missions of humanitarian psychi psychiatrists um, is, is not only to diagnose and treat, um, but also to serve as um, witnesses to mass violence and engage in forms of um, documentation that legitimize um, the rights of victims. Um, and trauma um, is often represented in this transnational model um, as a psychic wound um, that typically requires intervention on the part of humanitarian psychiatrists or other trained professionals to uh, facilitate processes of healing. Um, certainly two um, extensively researched topics within anthropology that are and in transcultural psychiatry that are consistent with this um, wound healing model is um, the traditional um, is um, studies of traditional healing um, and cultural idioms of distress um, and um, practitioners um, in local settings um, can certainly easily overlook um, aspects of traditional life that don't readily fit um, this wound healing model. Um, this is certainly true of um, cultural idioms of resilience. Uh, this is a concept which um, anthropologists are now only beginning to uh, name and unpack. Um, so I define cultural idioms of resilience um, as the particular ways in which members of sociocultural groups understand um, and express violence and suffering in ways that are non-pathologizing, um, affirmative of group and uh, of personal and group identity, um, that's adaptive, um, that offer meaning, solace, and hope, um, and that increase the likelihood that suffering will be overcome in ways that are um, generative and sublimating. Um, so also in the book, um, what I discuss is how um, a nitna is, is a cultural idiom um, of resilience for the democracy movement. Um, and the valorization of a nitna is really what places the Nanjin um, at the center of the social movement community, at the center of the democracy movement. Um, in the book, um, I, um, you know, I, I talk about how Nanjin 
um, sort of move through what can be conceptualized as sort of these phases in a rite of passage. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about a case study of one Nigerian. Um, his name is Pyeongcho, and um, it means sweet smile um, in Burmese. Um, so Pyeongcho was a graduate student at Rangoon University in 1987. Um, he was vice president of the Rangoon University Student Union, um, a very talented artist, poet, um, lived at home, was close to his family. Um, and then during um, the final year at Rangoon University, um, the military dictatorship at the time uh, demonetized the currency. Um, and uh, this demonetization essentially wiped out the, the savings of millions of families in Burma. Um, and the rural countryside was particularly impacted. Um, so Pyeongchul lives at home, uh, but he spends a lot of time in the dorms listening to his friends from the rural areas who are voicing their outrage about the demonetization. Um, there's um, sort of small scale protests and minor skirmishes between students and police. Um, the university ends up canceling the exams for that year. Um, they send students home. Um, they pretty much narrowly avoiding uh, larger scale protests. Um, and so Pyeongchul doesn't take part in these protests quite yet, um, but he deeply empathizes with the plight of the rural students. In 1988, um, the schools reopen um, and there's more violent clashes between university students and police. Uh, Ponma, who was an engineer, engineering student at Rangoon Institute of Technology, is killed. Um, and this, once again, the students are outraged. They lock themselves up in their dorms um, and they begin organizing. They, they begin distributing pamphlets to other students. So the Ponma incident is really when Pyeongchul first uh, um, has this feeling of dechua, um, which means um, a feeling of being moved or rise um, in Burmese. Um, so Pyeongchul says they used weapons, they shot and killed people, all of this was unfair. Uh, so the students decided to expose this. Um, the students organized staying up all night to write down their demands, uh, their vision for the future. I also stayed at school the entire night, which is quite unusual in the socialist era. There's, there's a household registry and everyone has to stay where they um, stay in their homes, essentially. Um, she, he said, I did not go home. Um, so Dechua, this, this feeling that's translated as being sort of moved or rise, um, describes a feeling of wanting to move towards something with the whole of one's body, mind, and emotion. Um, it's an inner state uh, where one is compelled to bring whatever action that one, one wants to perform to fruition. Um, this desire uh, to take action is nearly irrepressible. So there's tremendous energy, momentum, activity, eagerness, alert, alertness. Um, the person who feels dead joy feels sort of fresh and alive. Um, there's a focus, attention, um, absorption, concentration, what we would call flow um, as one move towards one's goals. And there's a strong sense of authenticity as well. There's a, a real feeling that you're doing something um, that, that emanates from inside of you. So Pyeongchul, after the Poma incident, Pyeongchul begins to have daily feelings of wanting to touch um, And he does so. He finds friends that he organizes with. Um, and then he, he says of this period, no matter how much they try to crack down, the momentum, the momentum of the protests we were creating, we tried to gather this energy anywhere and any which way that we could. Sometimes we got arrested. Uh, sometimes we had to run away quickly without getting captured. Sometimes we had to sleep away from home, hiding. So if I look back on that period, we were very young then. Also, we had to use whatever objects we got a hold of to make banners or flags. Um, but in terms of my mental state, it felt very pure. It, it was a very good time to work. Um, so there's multiple cycles of protests from March to August 1988 that the students organize. Um, th this student mo movement eventually culminates on August 8th, 1988, in what's known as a quadruple eights um, uprising or pro-democracy demonstrations. This is millions of protesters from all across Burma. Um, and in response um, to this nationwide protest, um, the military commits massacres in Yangon and other parts of Burma on August 8th and 9th. Um, and upwards of um, 10,000 people, I imagine, just in, in Yangon um, are killed. There's no official figures, the bodies are cremated. Um, but then after the massacres, it seems that the military retreats for a period of time and they withdraw. Um, the, the socialist government 
is officially dissolved. Um, the one party system also collapses. Uh, General Ne Win, who's the um, dictator of Burma, had already stepped down in an earlier cycle of protests. So it's, it was this sort of liminal space on a societal level. Um, during this time, the activists decide that they want to hold free and fair elections um, and possibly form um, an, an interim government. Um, in order to do this, um, they had to build up uh, their own political apparatus. So Pyeongchou describes this period. He said, we have to go to every single township um, during this time. There were 30 altogether in the Yangon region. So we had to go there on a daily basis tirelessly. We had to sleep at our friend's place. After the recruitment, I became emaciated and I rarely went back home since then. I ate whatever I found on the streets um, and did whatever work I found. I was traveling with a single bag and few clothes. So this is, um, I'll come back to this, but this is a very recognizable journey in Buddhist narrative, sort of the journey from home um, to homelessness. Um, in September of 1988, um, the military um, stages a coup. So after withdrawing for a period of time, they reappear um, and they essentially begin shooting everyone off the streets. Um, just in Yangon, there's probably upwards of 10,000 killed. Once again, there's no official figures as the bodies are cremated. Um, and tens of thousands of democracy activists, mostly students, uh, flee to the border areas of Thailand and India. Some of them take up arms. Um, tens of thousands of political prisoners inside the country are rounded up and arrested. Um, and this is the point that Aung San Suu Kyi actually gets involved with the movement. Um, and at the time, the students are actually quite split with some of them, once again, wanting to take up arms um, in the border areas. And this is why, why Aung San Suu Kyi won the Nobel Peace Prize within the country. She said, no, we're a single unified nonviolent movement. Um, so in the aftermath um, of the September coup, um, there, there was control and state-sponsored terror uh, that was escalated. So there's the prohibition of public meetings. So no more than five people could gather at a time complete um, and total censorship. So it was illegal to even own a picture um, of Aung San Suu Kyi or any of the student leaders of the uh, 1988 movement, including Pyeongchou. Um, there was a household registry. Um, so there's absolutely no freedom of movement. Um, a vast neighborhood um, surveillance network was set up. The universities and schools were closed for years at a time. Um, and there was also the manipulation of cultural narratives. Um, in both the urban and rural areas, there were forced relocations. So between 1988 and 1990, um, an estimated quarter of a million forced relocations took place in Yangon, right? So there were, there were land confiscations, these people's properties were seized, um, entire neighborhoods were destroyed and burned down and the property seized. And most of the neighborhoods that were targeted were those that had participated in the protest. So this is not in Rakhine State. This is not in any other border areas. This is right in Yangon, the capital. There's also forced labor, um, including in Yangon. Um, so every, um, every um, household would have to um, give uh, one able-bodied man to participate in different types of public works project, which essentially amounted to forced labor. Um, there was also intimidation, two-third of violence, imprisonment, death, um, a lot of sexual violence directed at young women. Um, many of them, because this, they were part of the student movement, were from urban, middle-class, fairly educated backgrounds. So these are undergraduate and graduate students at Yangon University. Uh, many of these young women perished uh, from the sexual violence. Um, up to this day, there's been no advocacy or no documentation around this issue. So at this point, um, Pyeongchou is wanted by the military. Um, they announce his name on the radio um, and he realizes he can't go home again. Um, so he goes into hiding. He never sees his family or friends and he only has uh, contact with a few other individuals. So there's this sort of deepening of the narrative of him being separated out from his previous networks and this journey from, once again, from home to homelessness. Um, many of the other students, after going into hiding, um, stop engaging in politics. Um, Pyeongchou, however, he continues to feel dejua. Um, he comes out of hiding regularly to engage in surreptitious acts of protest. Um, he narrowly escapes capture several times. Finally, in June of 1989, um, Pyeongchou is um, arrested 
and then he describes that day as he says, um, when I went out onto the streets to go meet my friend, um, they surrounded me. And I don't know since when they were waiting, um, they surrounded me and arrested me. They covered my face with a hood. Um, after covering it, they restrained this hand. Um, they handcuffed me. They restrained my legs. Um, and after wrapping me with blankets and pulling them together very tight, um, they put me on a car and took me to a place. I did not know where I was. So the violence um, inside the interrogation centers um, bear a ritual similarity to one another. So it was common um, for the authorities to mask or cover the Nigerian's face with a hood or cloth. Um, they often restrain, restrain the arms either by cuffing them behind their back or tying them above their head. Uh, Nigerian would be stripped of all clothing um, and their bodies would become objects of ritualized sadism. Um, some of the forms of torture that were used inside the interrogation centers, uh, Nigerian were forced to crawl upon sharp rocks, um, suspended in the air, beaten with sticks, uh, urinated upon, sodomized with snakes or cobs of corn. Um, they were choked, stabbed, uh, their genitals were electrocuted, um, hooded, they're forced to lie face down and then kicked, uh, forced to hold stress positions for hours at a time, uh, set upon by military attack dogs, um, iron bars are rolled up and down their shins, um, and gang raped. So the passage um, to the interrogation centers hurled the Nigerian towards death. Um, it, it really forced them to pass through um, a liminality where everything they previously knew, including their former bodies, were destroyed. Uh, and it was really in, only in destroying their former bodies that the Nigerian could then be reborn um, into the larger body of the movement um, where they attained um, what to them was a symbolic immortality. Um, so the violence in the interrogation center um, was not the final form of suffering or violence that they would endure on behalf of the movement, but it certainly constituted a threshold. Um, this is one um, Nanjin's account um, of his time in the interrogation centers. Um, he said, my body felt youthful. I did not feel worry. I was tortured in there. I was forced to lie on the ground filled with sharp rocks. Um, my knees shed so much blood. While lying on there, they beat, they beat me up over a hundred times. Um, I suffered there. I was forced to lie down my, um, on my chest, on the floor, and then two people beat me. I could not see them since I was lying on my chest. When I was at the concentration camp, they used electric shock on me. They put the cloth on my face. I had to kneel down on the sharp rocks and put the handcuffs on my hands behind my back. Um, a lot of blood came out of my mouth and ear when they put the iron bucket on my face and hit it. My eardrums were destroyed and started bleeding. So after seven days in the interrogation center, Pyeongcho was asked to sign a confession. Um, this is also quite ritualized um, and he refused. Um, the next day he was transferred to insane prison um, and Pyeongchul and many other Nanjin, when they're, when they're talking to me, they express a lot of pride in saying they never signed this confession. It's, it's affectively very satisfying for them uh, to be able to reassert their agency and their sense of dignity. So the ideal um, is to come through the interrogate, interrogation uh, without signing a confession or without exposing other members of the community. Um, many Nanjin don't realize this ideal. Um, so one Nanjin, described um, how the authorities actually brought in one of his friends that he had exposed. So he says, they dragged me by the hair um, and said, see who we've arrested? Um, I felt very bad, you know, because I ended up mentioning my older sister. He ended up implicating one of his friends. After that, she, um, because they kept beating me, there she, there she was also, um, but she felt sorry. Um, she also cried in front of him. Um, he says, we were like that, real comrades. She cried. Um, then when I was taken out to court, um, I apologized to the older sister whom I revealed and the other person um, I revealed. Um, when I apologized, um, this person was also like, don't worry about me at all. His family even went to inform my mother uh, about us being sentenced. Um, then so that older sister, she was also like, it's fine. Um, it was because they tortured you. Um, do not be sad for me, she said. I heard your voice. I felt sorry for you. Um, I cried. Um, so I was very happy, he says. Um, I was very shocked. Um, I was very glad, too. 
So revealing information about other dissidents or, or signing the confession at the end of the seven or 14 day interrogation uh, resulted in, in intense guilt and shame for Nanjin. Um, and especially the feeling of guilt really bounded um, Nanjin more tightly to others in the movement. Um, this was especially true because in lieu of anger and blame, uh, Nanjin um, received forgiveness and were op afforded a, a, an, an opportunity for redemption, um, which really um, on the part of other Nanjin, so it, it really elicited these feelings of gratitude um, and love. Um, so the forgiveness of other Nanjin um, signaled to Nanjin that the willingness, sort of the willingness of the entire community to really take up their, their bodies, um, which had been devastated and bruised, um, and give them complete acceptance. So there, this is also sort of a theme throughout these narratives, right? You move, they're moving from this sort of sense of violence, the liminality, the shame, um, and then to being delivered to other Nanjin who offer them acceptance, right? So it's moving from this sort of terror to, to communality. They're able to commune with other Nanjin immediately after being terrorized. Um, so Pyeongchou doesn't sign the convention. Um, so he's immediately transferred to prison. And he also describes that he, he said that he was hooded again um, when they were about to transfer him to the prison. And he said he was quite uncertain, quite, quite fearful. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know what awaits him in prison. He didn't know if they were going to go out and shoot him. Um, but he said once he got to the prison and they took the head off, um, the, the hood off, he said, when I got to prison, um, I got to see a lot of political prisoners. When I got there, um, I said, oh, my people are here. Uh, the worries disappeared. Uh, later on, I had to grow accustomed to the prison. I ate what I was given, lived as it was. Uh, but because I lived among my colleagues, uh, the disheartening feelings diminished. Um, I developed a mindset to be able to face everything. So once again, there's this sort of darkness of, of the hood or of being blinded. There's this liminality, there's this violence, uh, there's a terror, and then um, your, your, the blindfolds are taken off or the hood's taken off, um, and there, there's the community waiting for you, the Nigerian community that you, you feel this deep attachment to and that you can commune with. So at the end of his first seven-year term, um, Pyeongchou is uh, placed on trial again. He's sentenced to an additional uh, seven years in prison, um, and this is a, a pretty complex story that you can ask me about in, um, during the um, question, and, question and answer session. Um, he's transferred to a more brutal prison um, where he and other prisoners um, were actually chained um, continuously for one month. Uh, towards the end of this second seven year term, he begins losing his sight due to an untreated eye infection. He's transferred back to insane to receive medical treatment. Um, and then he's eventually released in 2003 after 14 years in prison. Um, so the developmental timing of this is early 20s to uh, mid 30s. Um, so between 2003 and 2007, um, amazingly, after his release, Pyeongchou reconvenes with other activists who are also being released at that time after also serving 13, 14, 15 year sentences. Um, and they begin to organize together. Um, he finds an organization called, called, called the um, 88 Generation Peace and Open Society, um, and they embark on um, activism. Um, they engage in letter writing and signature writing campaigns. Um, they engage in something called the White Campaign, which is when they would um, travel around the country and visit uh, families of political prisoners uh, while they were all dressed in white, which was the color of prison uniforms at the time, um, and presented the um, the um, pr political prisoner families with flowers and really hailed um, the sacrifice um, of their um, of their loved ones um, and gave them hope and solace. Um, they also organized multi-religious prayer campaigns for peace. Um, so in order uh, for them to avoid being arrested, they would pray and hold these, um, these prayer campaigns inside um, churches, mosques, Buddhist temples. Also during this time, Pyeongchou um, finds a life partner. Um, he becomes engaged. Um, he organizes a big wedding <laughs> for himself, which I always find quite, quite remarkable that he had the time to do this. Um, um, he marries. Um, 
Unfortunately, during this time, uh, Pyeongchang's younger brother uh, that went on, who was also an activist, um, is tortured to death um, in a Mandalay prison. So in 2007, uh, Pyeongchang, along with um, about 25 others uh, from the 88 generation, um, stage a protest. So they put on white shirts and they essentially uh, put on white shirts, hold hands and walk down the street. That, that was what, what, their, what their protest was. Um, and for this, uh, this, the authorities once again announced that he, he's wanted. Um, this time he doesn't hide. Um, he just waits for them and he goes with them when they come and arrest him. Um, and for taking this walk down the street, he's sentenced to 65 years in prison. And this was um, the first protest in what eventually becomes the Saffron Revolution, which is um, when the monastic order um, took up protests in 2007. Um, so Pyeongchang was released in a general amnesty in 2012 after spending 20 years of his adult life in prison. Um, I began conducting um, person-centered interviews and just sort of hanging out with him um, and this community in February 2013. And between 2012 um, and um, 2015, um, Pyeongchang travels uh, to Norway for lectures. Um, and community meetings, he makes two trips. He tours France, uh, Denmark, the US, uh, the UK, Thailand, and the Philippines to lead uh, town hall meetings with um, the Burmese community. Um, he, um, he engages in human rights documentation and advocacy. He organizes to um, amend the, the Burmese constitution. This is you know, 10,000, 20,000 um, people uh, rallies. Um, he attends and passes summer school classes at University of Oslo, um, and he, um, he was very excited about that. He, spent a, he got to spend an entire summer in Oslo, um, engages in diplomacy, teaching, writing. Um, he visited the United States for a little bit. That's the photograph of, that I took of him in front, in front of the uh, Lincoln Memorial, um, and that's him on, on the right um, in Paris. Um, and the whole time, he's really just a joy to be with. He's, he's upbeat. He's energetic, a lot of positive emotions, a lot of laughter, a lot of teasing. Um, and then in 2015, um, he's selected by Aung San Suu Kyi to run for parliament uh, in what becomes Burma's first uh, free and fair elections. Um, he campaigns very hard with very little resources um, and he wins. So um, in 2016, he assumed um, um, his, his office um, as a member of parliament and continues to show positive adaptation, competency, agency, uh, generativity. Um, he's performing very well in his new role. Um, or now his old or he's up for re-election again. Um, but um, he sent on diplomatic missions to India, Sweden, Bosnia. Um, he's really beloved um, in his constituency in Dalphone. So that's him uh, before and after COVID just making the rounds and um, visiting different members of the community, especially some of the elderly. Um, and then um, a little bit after he takes office, um, he and other dissidents are actually able to repeal um, the law that essentially uh, imp imprisoned all of them. So this is known as the um, Emergency um, Emergency Provisions Act uh, from 1950. Um, and so he, he was instrumental in having the, the, the actual um, legal uh, reason why um, they detained and imprisoned him. And he was able to take that um, and he was able to um, repeal it, um, which must have been very, very satisfying for him. Um, he's also, he was also instrumental in organizing um, the peace talks in Burma. Um, and he was still doing it even, even well into COVID. Um, he was also very engaging in a lot of infrastructure development in Dalpon. He built a bridge there. Um, Dalpon, um, his constituency is actually, is actually probably um, the most um, least developed and most impoverished out of the 30 or so townships that are in Yangon. Um, and as I said, Pyeongchang is a, a, quite a talented artist, so he really enjoys um, drafting um, you know, he's very involved in, in the building of um, different infrastructure. Um, so this is a um, sort of a, an overpass, pedestrian um, sidewalk overpass that he, um, he designed and that he, he built. And um, certainly Dalpo, when I started working with him in uh, 2012, 2013, it was entirely dirt roads. Um, it didn't look like this. 
Um, and, and now he's, you know, um, setting up community quarantine centers and uh, trying to battle COVID like we all are. So Pyeongchang's trajectory um, is not exceptional. Um, there's 181 members of parliament and in the current administration in Burma who were former political prisoners. Um, many of them have had the same journey that Pyeongchang has had. It began in 1988 um, and their life trajectories are shaped by participation in the democracy movement. Um, even after repeated exposure to violence, torture, uh, dehumanization, um, all forms of adversity and oppression, uh, they continue to display generativity, competence, positive adaptation and positive emotions. And even those who don't make it into parliament like Pyeongchang did exhibit the, uh, these exceptional qualities and responses to violence and adversity. So, um, so one question uh, that, I'll, that I'll grapple with for the rest of the talk is really, you know, why, why is Pyeongchang doing so well, right? So what's accounting for his resilience? So once again, I'm gonna, um, talk about this sort of foundational moral relational concept uh, known as anitna or sacrifice. And um, anitna offers, as I said, a very distinct epistemological framework for understanding um, human suffering. Um, and anitna is connected to a broader complex, um, all encompassing um, epistemology, right? Um, that of Theravadan Buddhism and I'm going to pause here to say that there's actually quite a large body of literature in the Western canon on sacrifice. And when I actually, um, as I was doing the ethnography and I realized um, that I was interested in the topic of sacrifice, this is, I, I started reading Totem and Taboo and I, you know, I started reading, reading Rene Girard. Um, and more often than not, I actually found that this literature uh, obscured uh, rather than shed light on what was actually happening with the Nigerian in Burma. Um, and it wasn't really until I really delved into um, the Theravadan Buddhism that I really began to understand what was happening um, with this community. So Aninas, um, as I said, it's connected to this imaginative world of Buddhism, um, which is radically different from the speculative thought, the presuppositions and concerns um, of Western, philo Western philosophy. Um, and Nitna embodies very particular conceptual structures and hypotheses about persons, selves, their nature, and social relationships. Um, and Nitna is also socially and historically derived. Um, so it represents and arises from very specific historical con and cultural contexts. Um, and it addresses and reflects very specific concerns um, within the Burmese community across different historical time, time periods. So there's, there's typically sort of two approaches to studying Buddhism. There's sort of a focus on the canonical and the textual and what the doctrine is saying. And then there's more of a focus on um, lay practices and beliefs. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the lay practices and beliefs and reference uh, some of the, the textual work. Um, so in terms of lay understandings of Anitna, um, it's very much connected to idealizations um, of maternal love, filial devotion um, and idealizations about moral responsibilities that exist between older and younger siblings. Um, so this is one um, person that I, I interviewed, a, a non nigerian um, who's talking about how his brother uh, sacrificed for him. He says, my eldest brother is like that too. He wasn't able to finish school. Um, he did not get a degree. He did not attend his last year of college and went abroad to work. Um, so he aninakan, he sacrificed. Um, now we only have love, fear, and respect for him. Um, we do what he says. Um, I feel sorry for him, so he has compassion for him. Um, I know that he aninakan for me, he sacrificed for me. So I listen to and obey him, whatever he says. Um, and then he goes on to say, um, you know, I feel sorry for him. Because of me, because of us, our oldest brother could not even finish his education. Um, but our siblings, when we feel gratitude towards them, we say, big bro, uh, big bro, this is for you, big bro, here, eat, eat something. So they, they, they offer him food. Um, he said, if we get our paychecks, we go out, out of our way to go pay respects to him. So they're actually sharing a portion of their paycheck with him. He says, during Burmese New Year, we pay respects to him. So we give back to him um, because he anit um, Yeah, and did that. We were, he, they, he says, our lives were, we got degrees. Uh, we went to school, 
Uh, we were not looked down upon by others. Um, I think about things like that and I always respect him in my mind. In my body, what I feel in my body is sometimes I feel sad. Uh, my big brother was not able to finish school uh, because of us. I feel like it's not fair sometimes. So Anitna engenders this really complex repertoire of emotions and motivations which sets into motion um, these sort of cyclical patterns of mutual moral obligations. Um, an individual's act of selfless sacrifice um, elicits feelings of warmth and love, admiration, um, gratitude, um, and no small amount of guilt. Um, and these emotions um, do not dissipate with time. So repaying someone who has a nitnaf on one's behalf is not accomplished um, through a single act of reciprocation. Um, and the obligations associated with an act of a nitna um, extend across one's lifetime and often across generations. Um, similarly, this rite of passage that I described through the prisons um, tied multiple generations of actual and fictive kin to one another in a, in a seemingly unending uh, cycle of sacrifice. Um, this intergenerational con connection infused Nanjin uh, with, with a sense of meaning as they continue the work of previous generations and prepared future generations to engage in similar forms of sacrifice. Um, so um, this is one example from Minkonai, one of the leaders um, of the democracy movement. And he says here, we acknowledge how much we value our cause and how much we have a nitna for it. We mainly thank our parents and the people. And then he says, we are continuing um, to walk on the path that they had created with their nitna, with their sacrifices, because we cannot create such a pivotal moment by ourselves. Um, and so we can compare um, sort of Mingo Nine's conceptualization of a nitna uh, to, um, to, to what the keynote speaker at a recent um, conference on women and trauma. And this is also organized by the Nigerian community, uh, by individuals who in that community who, who's, um, who've been um, exposed to this new sort of transnational model um, of trauma. Um, and so she's still using the language of a nitna, but she says, but for our future generations not to experience again what we have felt, faced, and in it now. We have a duty to, to take lessons from our stories and docu them, document them as a historical lesson so that in the future, the next generation will not experience it again. That is why we individually, these, these in it now, we cannot move past the in it now of the people who have in it now. So um, the customary meaning um, of Anitna, as I said, references how acts of sacrifice by one generation um, engender very similar acts by succeeding generations. Um, in this an instance, um, the speaker is using the language of Anitna, but she's calling uh, for the Anitna, for the sacrifice to be ended in this generation, which is actually a very common discourse or cry in human rights, right? You, you want um, to end something in, in this generation. Um, so Anitna is transformed um, in this context from a morally meaningful cyclical action pattern that is recapitulated across generations um, and reduced to essentially a negative feeling state um, that needs to be somehow moved past. Um, in Minko Nine's speech, in contrast, Anitna is not regarded as an obstacle that needs to be surmounted. It's not regarded um, as a historical lesson that somehow signals um, a need to break with the past. Um, memories of suffering are integrated into both personal and collective identities, um, and they're transformed into psychosocial resources, which eventually become foundational to individual and community well-being. Um, so the transcultural model of trauma, uh, with this emphasis on pathogenic memories and symptoms, which are construed um, as diagnosable and treatable on an individual level um, through talk therapy and other forms of catharsis, placed an unprecedented emphasis on, upon Nigerian's interiority, um, as well as the idea of being a bounded, um, individualized self that can be diagnosed and treat, treated on, on this sort of individual level. Um, a nitna, in contrast, or the traditional meanings of a nitna, um, is derived, as I said, from, from, from Buddhist notions, uh, Buddhist concepts, particularly Buddhist notions of selflessness. Um, and Stephen Collins writes, uh, Buddhism stands unique in the history of human thought in denying the existence of such a soul, self, or Atman. Um, according to the teaching of the Buddha, um, the, the idea of self is an imaginary false belief 
which has no corresponding reality and it produces harmful thoughts of me and mine, selfish desire, craving, attachment, hatred, ill will, conceit, pride, egotism, um, and other defilements, impurities, and problems. So Buddhist ideas about selflessness are integral to the larger Buddhist discourse on dana, or giving, gift, or the perfection of the virtue of generosity. Um, and dana is one of three means or pathways to acquiring merit, um, along with meditation and bila, which means um, morality, um, essentially um, following certain sort of moral dictates. Um, Dana or generosity, giving, donating is really the, the preferred way um, of, of earning merit for the Burmese or for the for, over these other uh, two ways of earning merit. And, and you can ask me about this in the question and answer too, is it's a complex reason for it. Um, and the most exalted um, form of selfless giving of dana um, in the Buddhist canon um, is bodily sacrifice. So there's a class of anitna that extends beyond the mundane world of family and kinship groups, which I've been talking about, right? I've been talking about the sacrifice of parents, the sacrifice of older brothers in relation to younger brothers. Um, so mundane forms um, of sacrificial giving that can, that can be performed by ordinary, ordinary men, typically in the form um, of ritual sacrifices, ritual giving, uh, can be contrasted with the extraordinary deeds of heroic bodily self-sacrifice undertaken by bodhisattvas or pyalams um, of past ages. Pyalams a Burmese word for bodhisattva. Um, and there, there are many narratives um, of in, in, in the Buddhist canon and the Jatakas of um, the Buddhas, the future Buddhas, gifts of the body, right? This is an entire genre of Buddhist literature. Um, so there's this one tale um, of the monkey king uh, so the monkey bodhisattva. Uh, so this is one of my um, subjects recalling the story. He said, if I were to, were to recall the story, um, the monkey king had many difficulties to pr protect and provide for his kingdom of 80,000 monkeys. Um, on this side of the river, there was no longer any sustenance. Uh, the humans were torturing them. So they, if they crossed to the other side of the river, there's a huge forest. Um, over on the other side, there's plenty of food. So the chief monkey, the seventh bodhisattva, tied his entire body, tied it with many branches and grass. Um, after tying it, he made his body as a bridge between two trees on either side of the riverbank. Um, then the rest of the monkeys, they had to walk across on top of him. So when all those monkeys walked across, it felt like his body was nearly crushed uh, because of the monkey's weight whenever the monkeys walked over him. He was in immense pain. It felt like his whole body was being ripped apart, um, that it was so painful he was nearly about to die. There was blood coming out by the waist. The bones were also broken, crushed. Um, until all the monkeys had crossed, he endured and remained there. When all, all the monkeys had crossed, he finally let go of his will um, and he died right there. Since the monkeys amounted to 50,000, just calculate, it's a lot of weight. With a million, 100,000, the weight is 100,000. And there's other stories um, of, of, of the Buddha, the, the future Buddha, the Bodhisattva um, giving this gifts of the body. There's a story of King Siva who, who is generous with his entire kingdom, giving him them treasures um, and, and food and gifts. Um, and then a blind man shows up, an elderly blind man shows up um, in his court one day and actually asks the king for his eyes. And he Im immediately summons the court uh, physician to remove his eyes and give it to the blind man. Um, so one, um, one thing that you can take away from these gifts of the Buddha narratives, um, one sort of uh, commonality across all of them, um, even if you're not a Buddha scholar, is that really the, the future Buddha is never healed in these cases, right? It's not like someone, a medic comes and helps the monkey king. It's not like, um, you know, his, he, because he was so generous, um, with his eyes and donated his eyes to the to the blind man. Um, no one comes and you know gives him eyes subsequently or heals him or, or helps him regain his sight. Um, he, he's also never given any reparations. It's not like you know people say, well, you know here here you go, you know you sacrificed your eyes. You should probably you know be given this by by um, the kingdom. Actually, in one version um, of King Siva, um, after he's 
generously given away his eyes uh, to the blind man, the people in the kingdom drive him out um, of the kingdom and tell them that tells him that he can't be king anymore because now he's blind um, and he has to retreat and go into the into the forest. Um, so, so circling back to this uh, notion of uh, the wound healing metaphor that's common in trauma and comparing it um, to the idea of sacrifice or the, the, the idea of anitna. Um, so the moral impetus in anitna um, is not to heal from a psychic wound or to recover from violence. Um, the motivation in anitna is to move through the liminality of violence, suffering, and loss in order to selflessly give to others. So in going through this liminality and moving through it, the sacrificer experiences a sacred transformation. Um, healing is neither necessary nor desirable because the new self that is symbolically reborn is not considered to be afflicted, but made pure through the sacrificial act. So the hero that has sacrificed, the hero that has a ninna, is quite distinct from the heroic victim of trauma, because we have that too. Um, we have representations of trauma survivors um, as being heroic. Um, and this is um, a wonderful ethnography, an excellent ethnography by Mukherjee. Um, and she talks about the Berengona, which means women of courage, who are survivors of rape um, in, um, in Bangladesh during the 1971 Liberation War and Partition. Um, and, um, she writes this this photograph depicts the women uh the woman the the, the virgona um uh, with her disheveled hair and her crossed bangle clad fists um, covering her face and this is a widely cir circulated image at the time um, on the one hand the women were seen as abnormal so mentally unstable as a result of the trauma as a result of the rape um, but also designated as virgona meaning brave or courageous courageous women uh, the, the Berengona and um, their re rehabilitation, uh, which was sort of a national undertaking, um, established the sovereignty, the lawmaking authority of the new state and its language of stateness. Um, and it became a trope symbolically evoking both the diamondism and humanity of the new nation of Bangladesh. So the, the heroism um, for the person who's in it now is, is, is different. Um, from the image of, of the heroic trauma survivor. Uh, this heroism emulates the extraordinary acts of self, uh, selfless giving performed by the Bodhisattva. Um, and um, circling back to Pyeongchul's narrative, uh, you'll recall that when he first experienced this, this, this desire to de you know, the, to, to move to rise, um, he leaves his home. And this is, once again, this is a very recognizable journey in Buddhist narratives undertaken by bodhisattvas and undertaken by the Buddha himself, this movement from home to homelessness. Um, so the Nanjin um, are not um, depicted um, in Burma um, as objects of suffering. Um, often they're depicted often as smiling, as beatific. Um, and the emotional landscape of a nitna, if you look at the emotions that are implicated in it, um, it's uh, from this chart you can see um, that, first of all, the vast majority of them uh, that's inspired by a nitna, uh, the particular configuration of them is that they're largely all positive and they're largely all focused on others rather than the self, right? Um, some, in terms of the action tendencies of these, these emotions that are prominent in a nitna, all gratitude, compassion, sympathy, empathy, guilt, they're all approach oriented. They're all pro-social, even guilt, that, you know, something that we think of as um, you know, a negative feeling state. When one feels guilty about something, you move towards that other person, the other person that, whom, you've, um, whom, the, whom you've transgressed against, um, and you try to fix whatever is happening, right? You don't do this with shame. Shame is something where you actually move away from people, you hide, right? Um, so all these emotions are approach-oriented, they're pro-social, they're affiliative. Um, and many of them are implicated um, in caregiving, which is very important in the democracy movement, especially in the prisons. Um, so one of these emotions uh, that I'm particularly interested in that's affiliated with Anitna is awe. And, um, and I, I actually don't have the references in there, but um, awe um, in experimental psychology, awe has actually been associated with increased in both helping and pro-social action. Um, 
on a cognitive level, um, when one experience the emotion, experiences the emotion of awe, um, you know, there's this sort of feeling of being in the presence of something greater, larger, more meaningful than oneself. Um, so the self is sort of experienced as smaller, but in a very good way. Um, there's this cognitive expansion that occurs, um, an increased flexibility. There's, there's this tendency to sort of broaden and build. Uh, these are all things that are contributing not only to individual resilience on the part of individuals like Pyeongcho, but in terms of the resilience of the community as a whole, right? You want, when, when, when you have a social movement um, where everyone's being persecuted and there's not a lot of rewards for participating in it, you want people to um, experience awe. You want them to be pro-social. You want them to help each other. You want them to constantly be in touch with something that feels um, like that's greater and more meaningful than what they are. Um, all also is connected to this notion of positive contamination. This is Paul Rosen's term. Uh, positive contamination is sort of the opposite of disgust. It's this feeling of wanting to reach out and touch saints um, or be closer um, or become one with um, whoever's uh, the moral exemplar or the ideal. Um, and once again, you know, just going back to that, that previous slide, um, you know, in a social movement, you want to be able to constantly replenish the supply of supporters who move towards you, um, you know, if you happen to be a leader and who move towards the, the moment and all facilitates this, right? And it's facilitated by these uh, bodily sacrifices that they engage in. Um, so these, um, the narratives of heroic, heroic self-sacrifice um, encapsulated by the notion of anitna are the organizing themes for a variety of rites and rituals in the Nigerian community. Uh, one ritual that I'll go over very quickly is the uh, notion of alepu, which is uh, translated as salute or giving respect. Um, alepu is a ritual of assuming a somber stance um, with bowed heads uh, combined with a moment of silence. This is, um, this takes place in front of, um, uh, at the beginning of every a festival and commemoration that the Nigerian community organizes. And it actually began um, first um, at the first major event where Aung San Suu Kyi spoke. Um, and then um, during, this, during this speech, uh, she says, this occasion has been made possible because of the recent demonstrations um, and also because the students have shown their willingness to sacrifice or knit not their lives. I therefore request you all to observe a minute silence in order to show our deepest respect for those students who have lost their lives and even more in order to share the merit of their deeds among us. So she's asking them to share sort of this Buddhist merit, um, which is um, sort of a common ritual practice in, in Burma. So in this case, you know, Aung San Suu is doing sort of a symbolic reversal, right? So she's uh, tr transforming what's normally a military salute where you stand with a erect posture, you bring your um, um, hand to your forehead, um, and she's um, having individuals engage in it uh, instead with lowered heads, eyes cast downward, arms hung down, um, and with a moment of silence. So she's really recasting um, those who had been massacred um, as national heroes and martyrs rather than enemies of the state. And she's ritually linking uh, the sacrifice of the student activ activists with the acquisition of merit um, by those who were present. Um, and you know, the, the, the community has an annual calendar of commemorations for um, all the atrocities um, and you know the passing of loved ones. Um, you know when when I do my field work, um, I probably and it's it's an incredibly dynamic, active community. They um, they organize sort of what they call Nigeriapues or these political festivals. Um, and when I was doing field work in Burma between 2013 and 2019, um, they would have anywhere from five to ten. Uh, Bues or political fe festivals every week. So I would normally be driving around uh, trying to attend all these Bues and I, I, it'd be very difficult to, um, to make it to all of them. Um, um, the political festivals often feature singing, uh, commensal eating, uh, drinking, uh, performances, um, including political oratory. And it would also, um, um, they would often sort of display their art and other material artifacts connected to the movement. Um, during political oratory, uh, Nanjin um, often referenced their past suffering. So there's nothing um, 
repressed. You know, these aren't these like traumatic memories that they never talk about. But when they do reference them, um, it's done largely through metaphor, imagery, and humor. They make jokes about it. Um, and it's done in a manner that's creative and spontaneous. Um, this is one example of political oratory that, that I always like to share when I make my presentations. Um, this is Min Ziyao, who's a, an excellent speaker. And, and he says, as we are reunited, so he's visiting Los Angeles, uh, so he's reunited with those in the diaspora. He said, as we are reunited with so many, uh, what we feel in our hearts is the feeling of utter joy and a gathering of strength at seeing our brothers, sisters, our family who were separated and torn apart for too many years. When I would think about the people here, I would ponder these people, these people, will I be reunited with these people through the rain, through the water, through the jungles, um, and through their mountains, through the hardships and suffering. We went through so many layers of hell, um, and now it's been a quarter of a century already. Of course, I wanted to be reunited with you. So um, more informal sort of testimonials, uh, these recollections that occur in everyday informal discourse also take place, um, you know, in, in this sort of spontaneous way. Um, it's in the presence of other members of the community uh, with, with whom there are mutual feelings of warmth and trust um, and, um, you know, with, with individuals with whom um, they have lifelong relationships. So in comparison, once again, um, the women of the trauma support group uh, performed, you know, took very seriously and performed the act of um, sort of bearing witness or giving testimony um, really by uh, recounting their suffering, but they would often do it in very minute detail from beginning to end. Um, often they did it in front of audiences consisting sometimes of relative strangers. Um, they often uh, reference their interiority, um, negative affect. Um, and after repeated testimonies, the narratives did uh, take on somewhat of a, a rehearsed quality. Um, the Nanjing community also um, possessed structures and mechanisms for creating intellectual um, and artistic content um, about their own suffering, um, including documenting human rights violations. So there's a lot, there's a very rich um, primary source material in Burmese in terms of thematic reports, uh, memoirs, literary works, poetry inspired by their time in prison, articles, uh, news programs, art documentaries uh, that the Nanjing community themselves um, have created. So just, just in conclusion, and I, I can go on because I've been working with them for seven years, um, but um, while political leaders like Pyeongchua and Aung San Suu Kyi continue to participate in these many rituals and comm commemorations within the Nigerian community. And there continues to be this deep emotional connection between them and the millions of Burmese who turn out to vote for them anytime there's an election. Um, the heroism and suffering of the Nigerian has not been officially incorporated into the national narrative, nor consciously appropriated um, into the public sphere. Um, and as the Nigerian's history is also not a part of existing scholarship and hasn't really been, uh, for a variety of reasons, taken up by the international community. Um, in many ways, both their, everything that I've described um, over the last hour, um, their cultural system, their personal experience, continue to be part of what, what's really this sort of subaltern history. Um, in the absence of this national discourse and with the discourse of uh, trauma becoming more pervasive in their communities, um, Nanjin are beginning to use terms like victim um, in lieu of the term Nanjin um, and engage in discourses about reparations and trauma um, in lieu of um, discourse or combined with, the, with, with um, ideas about Anitna. Um, and there's certainly a concern on my part um, that Nanjin will eventually become dispossessed of this very um, important um, idiom of resilience. So in inclusion, um, in 2016, I actually asked um, a female par parliamentarian from the National League for Democracy, also a former political prisoner, also an Nanjin, um, who often joined the women in trauma support group that I often observe, um, whether a reparation law or healthcare benefits uh, would be forthcoming to former political prisoners. And she explained to me that um, given the scarcity of resources present across the entire society, um, it was really difficult for them to justify um, additional benefits only for our people, right? So she references us as, as our people. Um, and then she paused at the end of the statement and said, well, 
you know, Nanjin will disappear after this generation. So the issue of benefits and reparations um, will no, no longer matter. So as I said, um, the community's previous understanding of what constituted a Nanjin tied multiple generations of actual and fictive kin to one another um, in this seemingly unending cycle of sacrifice. Uh, this intergenerational connection infused Nanjin with a sense of meaning um, and symbolic immortality. Um, and really these aspects of Nanjin identity are beginning to erode. Um, the term Nanjin itself is becoming to be, is beginning to be regarded by some members of the community um, as a category of victimhood based upon particular forms of suffering that now seem to them to be historically bounded rather than transcendent. Um, and so the Nanjin community has um, moved from a sense of immortality um, to the prospect of extinction. So thank you. And I hope I didn't go over the one hour too long. Thank you, Sainu. Yeah. May, may, I offer, may I offer some very brief remarks before opening it up for discussion? So, so first allow me to express thanks, you know, deep thanks for this, this really wonderful, compelling, you know, in many ways shocking, you know, expose. And, and uh, a thank you again for daring to offer what you might call a strength-based perspective. Uh, so the social sciences, like uh, their sister psychological sciences, often suffer from a deep obsession with deficit-based approaches on, you know, being focused on, on just everything that is broken and just how and why things don't work. Whereas, whereas you, uh, you yourself as, as a researcher, but also your, your object of study, uh, points us towards the ways in which things can work and flourish. And I think that's, that's really wonderful. So, the, so I wanted to share one brief observation, uh, pose an intractable question, and then conclude with, a, with an easy question. Um, so the observation I wanted to share is that, is that perhaps the wonderful idioms of wellness and resilience that you document themselves point to universal human processes that may not be uniquely Buddhist. Uh, so so what, what I take there from the idiom of resilience is a particular epistemology whereby it is not events in themselves that predict suffering, but the meaning that people assign collectively to their experiences. So that's something that is found in the Western tradition, for example, in Stoicism, but even more modestly in cognitive behavioral therapy. So I'll return to that uh, in a moment in, in my final question. The intractable problem I wanted to pose is through an analogy that I hope will be palatable to the audience. Uh, the really, really compelling story of, of, of the prisoners that you present reminds me of something in the Western context of the story of Senator John, Mc, John McCain, uh, who, as I'm sure you know, spent five years as a prisoner of war in, in Vietnam. So first, because uh, he refused to be released early because uh, his men would not be released, but also because he refused, at least initially, to sign one of these confession documents confessing to the imperialist sins of, you know, American colonialism and so forth. Of course, John McCain did sign the document after four, year, four years of relentless torture, two years of solitary confinement, and he says, every man has a breaking point, I had reached mine. And I sometimes wonder if the enduring health problems that you know, John McCain was subsequently plagued with are in a sense due to a moment of capitulation, not so much the breaking point being not so much being made to sign the document, but the moment of self-capitulation the moment of self-capitulation that leads to guilt and shame and so forth. Now, of course, John McCain returned to America as a hero. He was conferred high moral status. In many ways, he underwent one of those uh, costly rites of passages. And, and as in, again, as a, as a sort of a minor parallel, we find athleticism or even mountaineering are examples where people willingly undergo very painful experiences that end up being understood through the the virtues of perseverance, conferring one with moral status and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so the John McCain example, which is the intractable question of, you know, where exactly does capitulation leading to prolonged suffering lie? And that's a very, I think, intractable ethical question. The vanilla easy question that I have for you is, uh, it's a rhetorical question. So if you don't like my rhetoric, just let me know and give me your angle on this. But what are some ways in which the Western psychiatric idioms of trauma as they're becoming aggressively uh, implemented through, you know, such institutions as the UN and so forth. What are the ways in, in which these idioms of, of trauma are uh, lack 
the, the sort of the strength-based character, the idioms of resilience uh, that, that you so eloquently document. So again, thank you very much. So, so I, I would actually um, so, sort of tackle the, 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 the more complex question first because it's really fascinating. And it's something that, that I, I've been sort of struggling with. And I think you're absolutely right. It is fundamentally sort of the, whatever meaning making um, you know, whatever, you know, whatever meaning we derive from a particular situation, but that really doesn't explain, um, you know, the, the meaning that's derived from sort of, you know, what we cast as sort of the victim of trauma, right? And in, in some ways, many, you know, often like the, the example from the, the women who were raped in Bangladesh, um, you can have this entire national level and this individual level reworking of the entire narrative so that they do become heroic. And yet I, I found that there was just something fundamentally different um, that, that, you know, about the, the particular ways that sacrifice was being really understood in the Buddhist canon versus how we tend to understand it um, in the United States. And that's something that I really struggled with. I mean, why, you know, why doesn't totem and taboo resonate? You know, when I when I think about the narratives of the democracy activists, I really struggled with that. You know, I, I would read Rene Girard, and th these are very much steeped in the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? And I think you can take these um, these ideas and apply it, for example, uh, for how the international community or people in the human rights community understand a figure like Aung San Suu Kyi, for example, and how they're trying to make sense of it, which is a lot of scapegoating and which is all these other things. Um, but it really doesn't quite explain what was happening in Burma. And that's when I really um, delved into the Buddhism. In terms of these universal processes, um, I think the universal processes that I really draw upon is ideas of these, these rites of passage um, and limit out. And it wasn't like I went out of my way to, I didn't say, I wasn't like one of, you know, Harvey Whitehouse's postdocs. And I said, I'm going to go to Burma and I'm going to find, you know, these, you know, these, um, you know, instances of revelatory meaning making that they were engaging in. It was, it was just something that was there in the narrative and that was very stark. And that says a lot about uh, Western psychological and anthropological, anthropological science um, and what we understand about ritual and rites of pastors. I think that the universality is more um, in relation to um, those types of sort of conceptual sort of frameworks that we have as uh, social scientists and as anthropologists. Um, in terms of the, the difference between um, sort of idioms of trauma uh, versus uh, more sort of idioms of strength or wellness, um, you know, I'm, I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's really numerous, you know, I, I, I tend to be someone who, who, especially over time, working with this community, and I actually started off when I first started, um, got, got contact with this community, I was actually working as a human rights volunteer. That's how I first made contact with Pyeongcho. I, I interviewed him. I, I did a human rights interview with him. Um, and, um, you know, and expecting narratives of trauma and whatnot. Um, and, but then I, I was eventually um, surprised to find, um, you know, how little of these sort of tropes and these, these frameworks and concepts really apply to this community. And that's when I really had to, to search out other, other things that were happening, because really, um, and if I had, and if I hadn't really stuck around with this community for the seven years and learned about everything that happened in terms of the darkness and the violence, spending time with them, I would have never known. I mean, um, really, really um, an enjoyable, happy, uh, fun group of people, creative people to, to be around. I don't know if that answers, <laughs> that answers your question. No, no, thank you. I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. My, my worry, as I think you know, is that there's a well-meaning apparatus of uh, Western psychiatric model that end up accidentally re-traumatizing people by being trauma-informed in the wrong way. But, you know, I, I, I'd love to leave space for, for other people to ask questions as well. And, and I'm sure many people have questions. Thank you again. I have a, a question and maybe it picks up on some of this also. So the first is a question, uh, um, sort of an empirical or ethnographic question. Are there people uh, who have been through um, incarceration, torture, uh, you know, who have not become part of this community, who um, have distanced themselves from it, who were broken by that experience in some way, or, you know, uh, in other words, is this, a, is this a subset of people really in a particular trajectory that some people followed or were able to follow? That's the first part of my question or comments. Okay. Um, so, 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 um, so not everyone continued with the movement and the biggest difference 
um, that, that I find is between those who stayed in Burma and those even after spending time in the prisons um, who migrated outward to other countries. And I haven't, re I haven't really, um, you know, um, looked at this any, in any real um, substantive or in any real deep way. Um, but I think the people who end up in the States, who end up in other parts of the country where they don't have this community, where they don't have these rituals, um, where it's not so apparent that they're heroes and they're valorized, um, they don't have um, such positive outcome. And there are people, one, one um, who distance themselves from the community. So actually one of the ways that I connected with Pyeongcho when I first met him um, during this interview that I conducted with him initially um, was that he actually had very strong memories of one of my cousins who I did not grow up with because I, I'm a first generation immigrant as well, but my cousin in Australia who had organized with him um, in 1988 and was one of the last people that Pyeongchul saw before he was actually in prison the first time. He had seen him the previous night. They had snuck, both snuck out of their hiding place and hung a banner together and someone had been following them as well and then he, he was arrested. So he had this very, these very strong memories. My cousin um, didn't know who I was but immediately kind of connected to me as kin and I didn't really know what was going on because I was just there to do a human rights interview. Um, but my cousin, someone like my cousin, for example, eventually um, immigrated to Singapore and then to Australia, and he does not want to have anything to do with the democracy movement, apart from Pyeongcho, who he has very fond memories of. Um, but he, um, he, did, he has a daughter and he does not want her to, um, you know, to suffer in the same ways as he did. His, my uncle, his father, was also a political prisoner. Um, and, you know, was active in, in different movements that preceded uh, the democracy movement. So there's definitely um, individuals who've chosen not to. And I would say that they, they have, um, they don't do as well as, as those in Burma and those who are, who are consistently participating. But it, it, it's, it's, it's a very, you know, it's not anything, like I said, that I've looked at in really deep way or measured or anything like that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would just say it's important to think about that and think about alternate trajectories, because just as, you know, Samuel's critiquing the sort of trauma narrative that implies one trajectory, the heroic narrative or the, the resilience narrative is, is equally, um, you know, potentially tendentious. It, it is one way of saying this is what happens, and we like that story. It's, it's a testament to incredible human strength and resilience and so on, but it may also be an, uh, maybe a consequence of a certain kind of community, maybe a consequence of certain kinds of strengths or certain vagaries of what a person experienced, or maybe purely a consequence of selective sampling of people who fall on all kinds of trajectories, including people who are not doing well. I mean, you, you cited another person who's doing pretty well, but following a different trajectory kind of, but there may be people who are doing terribly. Uh, and, and, you know, it may not be, it may or may not be because of something about them and their history. It may be something in details in their circumstance, or it may just be these are the, and it's very important for me because, um, as I say, none of our narratives are particularly innocent about this. And, le and unless we have that very systematic kind of picture, we can pick and choose the story that we find inspiring or, you know, informative or add something to the, the common um, um, uh, the, the dominant narrative. And this is a case where there's a political investment, uh, deep political and moral and aesthetic and every other kind of investment in this particular narrative. So there are plenty, there's plenty of pressure, pressure on trying to, you know, adhere to that and, and live in a way that's consistent to that in some ways. And there's a big reward for doing that. So anyway, just this sort of a ca general caution about this and what, what lessons we draw from it. Kind of. Yeah, so, so, so two quick responses that the first is sort of reward the, the reward in the sort of particular narrative, the sort of heroic narrative. What's interesting about it, um, and I don't know, I, I try to describe it at the very end um, in the last two or three slides, but it's really fascinating that really, um, as a nation state, this isn't, hasn't really been taken up. You know, these are these rituals and commemorations that continues to just exist within this community. And, um, you know, the government, you can say it's, it, you know, um, that's in power right now, even though the vast majority, the vast majority of them are uh, former political prisoners or Nanjin, um, they've really, I, I have to imagine, I haven't really, you know, once again, studied this deeply, but I have to imagine that it's a conscious decision where they're not doing what Bangladesh did with the survivors of rape, for example. This is not really something that there's casting as part of the, you know, the imaginings of nationhood 
um, and, and not making, you know, they're, they're really kind of going out of their way not to do that. And once again, I think some of those reasons are, you know, the, the, some of these Buddhist reasons, they really want these individuals to be just sort of dust in the wind. I mean, they've, they've, they've suffered, it has to be entirely selfless. Um, and from our perspective, it's completely bizarre. I mean, like, why wouldn't you, you know, the suffering was very real, right? Um, look at, you know, look at, uh, you know, the, the, the journey of the tens of thousands of, of individuals who did that, and they did this for the nation state. Um, you know, I, I think um, that's why um, the narrative of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and her administration as being nationalist is really quite bizarre because they could have been holding rallies every week you know, like Trump does and, you know, hailing these people as heroes. She very specifically does not do that. She gives some speeches during um, election season, but it's really been an administration where uh, people like Pyeongchul are just asked to kind of selflessly serve. Um, and, you know, I, I, one of my research assistants actually recently um, volunteered to work at the quarantine centers um, for, for COVID patients. Um, and, he, and he told me that you know, he, he volunteered because there was this big call to, you know, sacrifice for the nation and go work at these centers. Um, and then um, he said that he didn't know anything about it. And then when he was being driven to the quarantine center, which was four hours out of town, they said, oh, you'll, you'll be given, um, you know, a certificate by Aung San Suu Kyi, and you'll also be um, given, you know, some form of, you know, if something happens to you, you get sick or die, there is like a little bit of insurance for you, although he wasn't really clear what it was. And they said, oh, we didn't want to tell you anyone this ahead of time, because we only wanted people with pure intentions. We wanted it to be, you know, entirely selfless, right? Um, so this is, is just this kind of this something that we would, we would think is quite bizarre. Um, and I forgot what the, the second point that I was, <laughs> was going to make. Oh, the, um, some of the individuals who, so, so th there are also Nigerian who have very good outcomes. Um, but as I said, that one Nigerian, for example, who signed the confession, right, or who, who implicated some of his friends, um, there's definitely something where I noticed that a lot of these little sort of moments in the interrogation room or um, even, and some Nigerian were not picked. Um, Pyeongchul um, was picked to run for parliament um, by the leadership in the democracy movement. There were many who were left out and that, that's also become um, a very um, sort of, a very particular set of political circumstances because now, um, you know, some of the members of the 88 generation that Pyeongchul was a part of is now forming a, a separate political party called the People's Party and they do uh, reference more this suffering. And I think if they come to power, um, as particularly this particular charismatic figure, Gogoji, um, he's really going to make use of this narrative of, of sort of the heroic um, political prisoner. Um, but it, it, it's, um, I think some of the, um, the ways that they um, relate to that narrative and how um, the implication it has for their well-being, it's also is connected to um, how much they're realizing or um, or feel themselves to be realizing that ideal of sacrifice yeah. and mental purity. So two quick footnotes to that and all, all other people can talk. So one is, uh, as you were talking earlier uh, and uh, talking about the, um, um, well, and also Samuel sort of talking about this intractable problem and the question of sort of what goes on in that, that place of um, maybe deciding that you're going to sign uh, this thing. Uh, I think, again, I'm, my concern is that we not understand everything as a, agentic and as people, dis, you know, they hold out to a certain point and then they give in. I think that's a very oversimplified view of what's going on psychologically or in terms of human endurance. And what's behind that for me is, is uh, Primo Levi's essay, The Drowned and the Saved, yeah. uh, which really cautions uh, about sorting people out based on their trajectories. Uh, that, you know, there's so many accidental things, so many things that are beyond uh, any clear uh, account that we, uh, we have a moral and an ethical, and I would say a scientific, if you will, uh, sort of obligation to be careful about not drawing the, the simple moral story from this and seeing things that are agentic that are not and so on. So anyway, that's, that's one footnote. The other footnote is, is uh, Carol Kidron's work, which uh, you may be familiar with, where she has looked at uh, the uses of trauma, both psychologically but politically, and her contrast is between the state of Israel, where the tr transgenerational transmission of the impact of trauma serves clear 
a function of validation uh, in terms of the legitimacy of the state and its whole raison d'etre, and Cambodians uh, and children and, and uh, third generations, uh, which she studied in Canada and, and, and other places, so, and in Cambodia, where, and, and it's useful to you because, uh, again, the, I mean, she's actually looking at another Buddhist context uh, in which some exactly some of the same strategies go on of like let's let go of this. This is past, you know, is past karma now, and we we're going to be able to change things now by how we act. That's what really counts, and so that's and that's how parents think about what they want to narrate or share with their children and so on. Very different than the um, the Jewish uh, and Israeli. Uh, um, sort of political use of this as a form of identity and moreover as a transgenerational identity that's actually important socially. Lawrence, briefly in de defense of the point you just made, even yeah. Victor Frankl, who's the grand guru of the meaning will sa save your life narrative regardless of the adversity, you know, uh, he begins his book by pointing out that what tends to get left out of a lot of heroic narratives is the things that people had to do to survive. And, and, and in the com context of Auschwitz, he says, you know, often the best one of us just did, did not return. And, and, well, and we don't know. In other words, all the people who, who may have done exactly the same things and didn't survive are not in our sample. So, so just a general sort of methodological caution. It's not to say we can't learn things or, or posit things or whatever, but it's just a sort of a general caution. Uh, I say you start at the methodological level just in terms of what we're doing, but there's a deeper moral question, which is what... Levy's essay really is about is where do, where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis this because also there is this valorization and sacralization of those who, who've died in sacrifice and again this fits very much within a judeo-christian kind of paradigm of what what's the meaning of suffering and what's the the, the uh, you know the most profound meaning of suffering Should we accept other questions? Right? I don't please, know. If, um, please, yes, other people should please speak up. Once again, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to navigate this. So they sort of have yeah, we to. We just ask somebody to <laughs> mute themselves if you want to speak, please. Hi. Um, hi, Professor. I think. I think you're present. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I'm trying to find you. <laughs> I'm trying to find you on the. In introduce yourself because we have a mixed group of people here who don't necessarily know everybody. And we didn't really have time for introductions. So please introduce yourself briefly and then please go ahead. Hi, right, absolutely. I'm Mandy. I'm a uh, master's student at uh, in the cultural in the psychiatry department at McGill. And I'm actually taking the cultural psychiatry course with um, Dr. Kamaya and Dr. Uh, Bris and um, <laughs> and um, I wanna. I thought your lecture is so fascinating, and um, thanks. So thank you so much for sharing your presentation. I have two questions. First is um, whether it will be possible for you to share the um, presentation like afterward, like the PP, the PowerPoint slides, and okay. That would be great. And um, secondly, I was wondering, because I came from, I was born and raised in Beijing, uh, China, and I saw a lot of parallel, I guess, in the sense of how, um, the, I'm, I'm sure you know of the Tiananmen massacre in China that happened in 1989, and how kind of, I guess, like, a, like as a collective community, the trajectory, how it really derails from um, the democracy movement and um, and th that's why, like, I was wondering if you have any insight on that, like, kind of almost like comparing the community, like, what do you think makes this Nigerian commu like, community in um, the in Burma able to kind of thrive and even like take the lead almost now in the political stance? And like, how, like, what do you think? What do you think of that in comparison, kind of to like a to the other parts of the world, like China? Um, so, so I, I know very little about Tiananmen Square. I read a little bit on it, um, but my understanding is that the Chinese government, I mean, those leaders are still locked up. So okay. it, 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 it's, it's sort of a, a right, am I correct about that? I, I, think, yeah. one of, yeah. I, I think one, I, I believe, um, immigrated, I think, to, to Singapore or Hong Kong, and I, I believe he's in the United States, and I, I, he, he read a book that I've been meaning to, to read. 
Um, but apart from that, I mean, they're still locked up. So, I mean, you can really kind of attribute it to just how, you know, how much more extreme the Chinese government has been um, in sort of, you know, sort of trying to repress that movement, that student movement. Um, the one thing about the Nanjing community too, is I didn't really get to go into it, uh, but it's been, it, even, you know, 1988 was when, when this resistance movement against the socialist government started. Um, but these, um, many of these individuals, including Pyeongchou, including my cousin and uh, my uncle who participated in it, um, were, are descended from and are actually um, related to um, individuals who organized um, during the, um, the resistance movement against the British. So, so, so the independence movement, movement against the British. So, so this has been sort of this multi-generational community and a lot of um, sort of what I discussed, um, you know, in terms of some of the, even the, the stances of resistance um, and some of these rituals um, began in the era of independence during, during the colonial era when they were um, protesting against the British. Um, so it's really been this sort of intergenerational um, sort of culture that's been passed, you know, this sort of cultural resistance that's been passed. Um, and I'm sure that that's contributed to how well they've been able to sort of reproduce these, these sort of actions and these, these sort of discourses um, over time. Um, and I don't know that that was the case for the, the for Tiananmen Square, just by just, you know, in broad strokes, what I know about modern Chinese history versus modern Burmese history, um, I imagine um, it was it was quite a different set of circumstances um, in Tiananmen. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for your insight. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think that definitely, I, I guess, like, for Burmese, like, it's also a relatively, like, I don't know when did Burma become independent from the colonialist regime? And, uh, it was granted independence along with India in the 1940s. Okay, okay, then that's kind of almost a similar trajectory as China went through in the sense that China, well, China never was colonized, but, like, there was a lot of, like, a uh, I guess wars like with Japan and like uh, involved in the World War and there then there was like the independence movement that happened in 1949 as well. Um, yeah, so I guess like I the reason why I asked the question is because I was almost wondering if there's like a cultural trait like if there is some mark of the community that kind of like led them to be able because oh you also mentioned the concept of the flow like tacon te or yeah like. <laughs> Yeah, and I was just wondering if there are, like, it, this, all, this is almost like cultural, like, born of, like, of a character, uh, characteristic. I'm not, yeah. So, so I think it was, it was many cultural um, characteristics um, and also very particular set of historical circumstances, um, even sort of historical circumstances, as I said, that they didn't, I mean, why didn't they, I, I was presenting on this once and someone posed the question, you know, well, why didn't they just take all those students, why didn't they just take Pyeongchul and go out and shoot him? You know, why did they keep him alive? Um, and I don't really have, you know, ready answers to that. I have some ideas of it in relation to, you know, in the book, I also talk about some of the sort of pre-colonial um, folk beliefs um, that was rampant. Um, in Burma, um, and that's very much connected to both um, the spirit cults and to um, to beliefs about Buddhism and, and this arrival of a universal king and what it means, you know, in terms of karma and you know to 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 actually harm someone who might be the next universal king, which is very much a concept within uh, Theravada Buddhism and very very uh, very much still I think um, something that has a lot of meaning for um, for people who grew up in the villages, including um, military and soldiers who were trained in the villages. So I think that might. Be one of the reasons why but it's it's really you know you just kind of you don't know why you you really don't and i don't know if, if, if lawrence has a better answer or samuel has a better better answer than what i can provide that is absolutely fascinating because my thoughts first go to political differences and, and political ways in which um also memory and public commemoration has been handled and in particular this novel i don't know if you've come across it um called uh, uh what's it called in english it's called uh the fat year uh, by, um, uh, see, I've got it here in front of me, I can never remember properly, Chan Kun Chung. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a novel that was banned in China, but widely available, uh, you know, circulated from, uh, and it basically is a little, kind of a science fiction novel that says that um, this guy, a narrator in the novel, suddenly realizes that he's missing a whole year, he can't remember, missing a whole year of memory. And he starts checking with other people and discovers other people are also missing the year. And it's the year after Tiananmen Square. Uh, and then it and then it turns out that the government has been putting Prozac in the water 
uh, and also systematically controlling all the media so that people will just forget this and move on to the economic boom that they're going to have now by, by reorienting things. So it's, you know, it's an allegorical, but, but closely parallel. And there's a point in the novel, not to do, give too many spoilers, where they kidnap a party official and torture him until he confesses to what the government's doing. And when you read it as a non-Chinese, it's like 40 pages of detailed stuff about this and that. And, and, and the translator explains, this is quite boring to Westerners, but to Chinese readers, this is utterly fascinating because this is like an expose of the unstated things about what's really going on in terms of government manipulation and corruption, or whatever. So people read this in a riveted way when they, when they got, anyway, that, that just to me speaks to this whole idea of deliberate control and management of memory uh, and so on that has been done systematically. But anyway, that was what I first thought. But what you said just now is so interesting, Zina, the idea that this Buddhist value system that you know, you're describing in relation to these dynamics of the people who've suffered might also in subtler ways still be present in the thinking of the military rulers, of the, of the torturers, of the people who we think are just doing this oppressive thing and we, we don't culturalize it. We just say it's just, it's just brute force and violence and you know, tr suppression. But the idea that it might actually be inflected by, and things that they may or may not be fully conscious of themselves, but, but, but things that are part of their cultural background that are then tempering the way they do this, I think is quite fascinating, quite, quite intriguing. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Kamaya, for your insight. That that makes a lot of sense. And um, I, I was also thinking, um, just if it, I, I don't know about Burma history, but like in Chinese history, there uh, we've been through like a lot of dynasties and like it's because of the, like my mom always has this kind of like hypothesis in the sense that Chinese people are a lot more subservient and that's like not just from um, like from like Confucianism, but also just from like dec like thousands of years of monarchy and just so like when when we pop up like just a little bit of like re rebellion when it's like being shut down so briefly it's like it became like that's like kind of why this cultural trait is not really instilled in the, in our ethnicity if that makes sense i don't know if that's controversial to say but <laughs> yeah Lawrence, I think you have to be um, unmuted. All right. I would say that some of those things are co common to many Confucian societies. So then the question is like, how, why is this more pervasive, more intense, more persistent in, in China? And again, part of that's political. I mean, I, I had a student many years ago who was a physician uh, at, and was present in Tiananmen Square giving sort of first aid to people there and so on, and who eventually emigrated. Uh, and when she encountered the uh, Arthur Kleinman's writing about Chinese emotion and whatever, she was very perplexed by it because she said he's making all these claims about culture, uh, but the overwhelming consideration is that we're living in a police state under constant surveillance. Huh. So you can go for psychotherapy and talk to somebody, but there's a good chance they're gonna be called down to the police station later and they're gonna play a tape of, your, of that supposedly private conversation. So, and I think Arthur Klein is aware that that stuff does go on and did go on and whatever, but he could not talk about it if he wanted to go back and do more field work in the future. So it puts a certain distortion into the whole account and a, and a general problem for us in terms of what is cultural, what is political, what is, you know, I, I think it's really, uh, uh, well, I guess it's a, maybe a false dichotomy, but it's just important that there are these very powerful what do we call them, structural constraints on, on what people can do and what, what's safe and what isn't safe and you know how to approach it. And, and you, I think you can also interrogate these narratives. I mean, where does the narrative really come from that, that you know, Chinese people are subservient and, you know, and it's very easy to put down these protests. You know, it, it, it's, it, it, may, it may not be the case. I think one of the, the issues that I encountered when I was um, sort of uh, first um, looking at the democracy movement in terms of the historical accounts of it and the historical representations of it um, was that um, there was such continuity, um, the ways in which uh, both academics um, and, and sort of, um, and even the military themselves sort of understood the 1988 demonstrations, for example, was very much rooted in sort of the narrative and, and discourses um, of the idea of sort of rebellion in colonial Burma. 
and there was uh, there's there was those discourses were really being recapitulated so uh, most most of you um, some of you may have heard of the 1988 uprising before this this demonstrations and it's specifically called an uprising and the 1988 uprising and 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 you know most people don't know about the existence of this community don't know that there were cycles of protest and they carried on for 27 years uh, because the idea was that it was squashed with just that one big event. And that's very much um, a discourse that the military um, sort of propagated, but that they got from the colonial predecessors where there's this idea of the Burmese, um, you know, engage in these sort of rebellious acts, which often happened uh, during the colonial era, and then it's easily squashed. And then, you know, they're kind of um, silent and tame for a period of time as well. Yeah, that's a lot to think about. Thank you so much for your presentation and for talking with me. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or? We have five, five more minutes, last chance for people to raise some, some issues or reflections or questions. Well, may, may I ask another question then? Um, I was hoping we could momentarily return to uh, whether or not it's possible to identify some universally protective mechanisms. Uh, yeah, to frame experiences in such a way as to be protective regardless of the harshness of adversity. Um, so, and, and perhaps, perhaps people, elders among us with more clinical experience can, you know, can jump in and, and help answer this question. But I wonder if it's possible if there are many known cases of people who say undergo very difficult experiences, but then all the, all the components are there. So there is a, pardon the crude metaphor, but a sort of an athletic sacrificial uh, framing of, uh, of torture as, as, again, something that confers high moral status to one. Uh, the individual subsequently receives a lot of love, a lot of social support. They're, they're deemed to be a, a hero, a moral person. Uh, one next element seems to me as pertinent as forgiveness. So being able to let go of the grudge, let go of the feeling of injustice and, and victimization. And, and again, a sort of ideology of selflessness is, is helpful there. So are there, are there known cases of people who they've done all that, it checks all the boxes and yet there is prolonged impaired suffering? I'm, 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 I'm very curious. Lawrence, do you have any? <laughs> any? Well, I'm sure that there are, because I, I, I think when you frame it like those would be sufficient to deal with anything, you're talking like an idealist philosopher, like it's all in the mind. Uh, I think that, you know, the violence we're talking about impresses itself on people in many different ways, uh, in their bodies, in their social worlds, in their thinking. So I don't believe, although I think, you know, people's attitude toward things is very important uh, and it can definitely make things much better and there are people who uh, seem to have better quality of life than other people, despite horrible things they live through. Um, I don't think that that's universally works for people and so on. The other thing I think that's uh, the mistake in some of that, I think is that there are temperamental differences in the first place. Mm -hmm. my, gran my grandfather, you know, came as an immigrant from Eastern Europe. There was no category of refugee, but he was, you know, playing hooky from, synagogue one Saturday and the Cossacks came and killed all of his relatives upstairs. They were playing cards downstairs and they came up and they found bloody bodies and screw things. But he, he was not a traumatized person. He was not aware of that category. It's not how he talked about himself. But I don't think it's because if, if only he'd had that traumatic category, he would have been infected by it and then he would have done poorly. My grandmother, who had uh, also difficult experiences, not quite as severe as that, did much more poorly in terms of how she functioned. She was very anxious and hypochondriacal and so on. And she has stories of being a child and bullets flying over. And so she was also traumatized. So I think, yes, some of it's mental attitude. And my grandfather and his dying bed, I'm using a very personal example here, but it definitely illustrates the, the story. I mean, and is, is, is late in life, he said to me, life is not what it is, it's what you make it. Mm -hmm. So there, there's that stoic or whatever, CBT philosophy, kind of, you know. Yeah. It's exactly what you're saying. And it's true for him. It's true for him, but not just because he has that idea and not just because he's a flexible person, but probably because of many things about his constitution, both psychologically and dare I say physically in terms of how he would, 
how he you know was able to live his life. So I have, as a clinician, it's partly maybe because of the stance as being a clinician where you're trying to empathize with people, not blame them for their suffering or their problems. I'm extremely cautious about sorting people. That's part of the critique of resilience. It's like, it's good to be resilient. And if you're doing well, you're resilient and therefore you get credit for doing well, but maybe you know it's an accident why you're doing well. You know, I'm glad you're doing well, but I, it's not necessarily a virtue to do well. It's not a virtue to, to not do well. It's not, it's not, a, not a virtue. It's not a, a personal failing to not do well. You know, that's, that's the gist of, of Primo Levi's argument. And, and I, uh, to me, it's quite important as an ethical stance, uh, partly just because of limited knowledge, but partly because of, I, I mean, I, uh, for me, you know, what it comes down to is I think if it was me, I don't think I'd do that well. So I have some compassion for other people who don't do well. And, and I can't, you know, just say, oh, that's the way it's supposed to be. And if you were just made of tougher stuff or just took a better attitude, it would all be fine for you. I think that's actually very naive, that, that, that approach. Sure. And in keeping with the John Henryism hypothesis, resilience is also death by a thousand cuts and eventually you collapse. Well, that's right. And resilience, I mean, realistically, resilience does not mean that you've been through horrible things and you come back stronger. What it really means empirically is you've been through a lot of things and you come back different. And some of those things are strengths and some of those things are vulnerabilities. And you can show that when you have when people who actually do resilient studies show that there are trade-offs. Uh, and, and who knows? I mean, you, again, Sinead focusing, you're focusing on certain aspects of these people's lives. It would be possible to, to look critically at it in certain ways and say, well, there are other ways in which they have certainly paid a price or in which they have certain areas of rigidity or certain kinds of empathy for others that they can't have because they're so much in this mode or I, I don't know. I don't want to say anything because it's totally pulled from nowhere. But I'm just saying when you actually do do studies of resilience and in, in, in more modest circumstances, you find trade offs. You find that it's not that, oh, great, you, you went through a bad thing and now you come back and you're twice as strong and everything's okay for you. You find, well, you cope with this in a certain way and you're doing well or better there. And there are other costs if you start looking around at what, you know, what it did to you. So I think that's just, I'm speaking very generally now, but to me, that's just a re more realistic picture of what usually happens and protects us from this exaggerated view of, of uh, you know, that comes with the resilience literature and with the metaphors of resilience, uh, you know, that are, are um, very exaggerated. It's true of materials, you know, resilience is drawn from material science. When you, when you bend a material, it changes. It's not like it may spring back, but it's now changed. And in fact, it now is likely perhaps a greater risk for fracturing under certain circumstances. So the other way of understanding this also is the community has served to protect people from certain kinds of fractures that could otherwise occur. So is the resilience in the individual or is the resilience in the community? You know, some combination of those two in a way. I think it's also the particular subject that I focus on. And it just so happened that, um, you know, Pyeongchuk was the first person I met in the movement, but I mean, he, and also another one of my subjects who actually did pass away, he, you know, so, so he, he was, had, had a very similar profile to Pyeongchuk in a lot of ways. Um, but, um, you know, he got liver cancer because he, he got hepatitis in the prisons and he, he passed away in um, 2016. So, you know, even if, if your mind is quite resilient, your, your body doesn't always survive that. And for, for many people, they don't. Um, and so, but, um, I, I mean, Pyeongchuk, I'll, I'll introduce you to him one day. Maybe we'll, we'll do a, in, in the name of sort of decolonizing and sort of bringing other discourses, maybe we'll do a section with him. But he, he really is quite remarkable. It's not anything that I, I'm, I'm exaggerating about. Um, there's many other people in the movement who've had, who've had both similar and different trajectories, but um, 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 quite, quite, quite remarkable. And, and one of the things that he, um, he actually said to me, very similar to, to your uh, grandfather, was that, well, you know, I would ask him about if he didn't lose hope in the prisons, and he would say, oh, you, you know, if there's, there's five people, you know, in a room, um, and you ask, you know, each one of them for help, at least two of them would help you. And even with the prison cards, so there were five prison guards, if I would ask them for help, even if, if, they, if they sometimes came to me occasionally and said, you know, how are you doing today? that was a form of help. They were trying to help me by asking me that, you know, so he, he really did have this kind of particular, you know, attitude about life. Mindset, yeah. Yeah, so the question again is how much can you learn that? How much is that, 
you know, a certain philosophical attitude, a certain coping strategy, and we'd all do better to have more of that. I'm sure that's true for me. I would definitely do better to have more of that. Uh, but then again, it, the part I'm just resisting a little bit is Samuel's way of framing it like, not that this is it's a universal process, it's just not a user, universal solvent or cure for everything that ails you. That's, that's kind of the point. I, I agree that these, you know, being future oriented, finding the positivity in a difficult situation, et cetera, et cetera, all these elements are going to other things being equal, be helpful and having, having a valorized meaning for what you're doing and what you're enduring. So it's not meaningless and corrosive in that way. All that's going to be good, but it doesn't mean that therefore you have limitless capacity to deal with whatever, you know, so. But Lawrence, would you say that on a societal level? So, so Samuel gave the example of John McCain and at the end of his life, I don't know how he must've felt that, you know, that, that there, there was an entire discourse in America about how he was a loser because because he had got, you know he had gotten captured by the North Vietnamese, um, and so you know on this sort of societal culture level, it seems like there might be something to having these frameworks and these concepts that really emphasize a certain sort of form of personhood, uh, certain orientation, um, you know, towards um, being human. Um, that appears to be completely undone in the present day. President of the United States. Exactly. I, I wonder right. you know, if there's really, because that particular comment about uh, McCain being a loser, I mean, we know it, it reflects the, the psychopathology of one, you know, leader, we don't have to name, but I wonder, I wonder if there's really a consensus uh, in, in, in America about that. And, and in fact, one of the things I like about the John McCain story is that, you know, many card carrying, you know, Democrats would not praise a Republican, you know, to save their life. They typically mention John McCain. Now there was a solid guy. Now, so there's something re reconciliatory about that. At least that's because I too suffer from perhaps too positive a mindset. Perhaps I'm not really seeing, you know, um, but, but, but I often, I, I like to invoke the story precisely because it, it's often one that can help reconcile people. Um, but, but, Perhaps you're correct. Perhaps there's another segment of the American population who focuses on the on the sort of loser dumb aspect. But. Well, and 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 the loser part also comes from the zero sum thinking. If you can say yes, he you know he was broken at that point. He went on to have a good life. It, it certainly scarred him in certain ways. He had to live with chronic pain. He had other things he had to deal with. Uh, and so let's not exaggerate. Uh, the burden that he's carrying. And maybe maybe we think he's doing great, but he knows that because of dealing with chronic pain, he's functioning at 80% of what he would have done had he not have to live with that. So in other words, we're making a story that's a partial story. And I'm, when I'm saying this, I'm coming partly, as, again, as the researcher who says, let's try to understand these processes and, and keep in mind all the, all the pieces, but also uh, the ethical stance of a clinician where uh, we want people to live better lives. But we don't want to say you can take the high road or the low road, or you know, there's a hero's path and there's a, a wimp's path. And which what which are you going to take? You know, this is not how we engage with people. We it's a much more humble, much more concerned, uh, and for me anyway, much more modest uh, thing of finding what will work for this particular person. Because as I, and for me, behind it is always you know there for the grace of God, you know, but for the grace of God go I. I have no idea how I would deal with with uh, these things, you know, if I had to deal with them. And generally, I suspect I'm not Nelson Mandela. I'm not you know. Uh, uh, Pyeongchang, uh, you know, it's not, it's just not going to be the, the case. So anyway, that's, I, I, it's a caution for me. Be, and, you know, as you know, I mean, we, I've been quite interested in the whole issue of resilience that has come up around indigenous people where, again, the interplay is between individuals who do well and the fact that the whole community faces adversity. So, but then does it mean the people who do well are special now and everybody else is 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 limited somehow so there's a lot of concern that that the resilience framework does a lot of damage in that way because it starts they're winners and losers clearly in that frame uh, and that's not how we should be looking at these things uh, but i do agree that there are communal ideologies uh value systems and so on that are helpful or harmful to at particular in particular ways to people but i would also say there's always trade-offs so the benefit of the trauma language is it has allowed people to point to things in the environment, to point to violence, to have a name for it, to have a name for the effect it had on them. And that has been an important way for people to challenge, people who have no, uh, no legitimacy for their complaints or concerns. We're just supposed to suck it up and get on with it. Or if you were strong, you wouldn't complain. 
have been given a, a voice to, to push back against real violence that they've experienced. So that was the, in the 60s and 70s, and so on, the very positive thing that was happening in the area of child abuse, in the area of sexual abuse and, and other things like that. So, so I would no, never say that, oh, the trauma language is all bad and it just you know, disempowers people and makes people feel like victims. I think all these, these are all partial truths. They're all particular exemplary narratives and they all involve trade-offs for people. So again, I'm speaking, both at the level of a, you're trying to make a model as a researcher what's going on, but also as a clinician where you're trying to find some balance for the person in front of you and what, what stories will work to help them to, to make the best of, the, of the, you know, their predicament. Do you think the trauma pendulum has swung too far in, in, the, in the other direction of constantly pointing at, at you know, suffering and, and potential trauma and... Yes. <laughs> I think Alan would Alan would agree that it's. Uh, I mean, this is also what Didier Fessin and Richard Reshman talked about, and so on. The empire of trauma. That I, I don't know. I think I, globally, probably yes, but I also think you have to look at things on a case by case basis because I would say there are situations where that language allows people to say things or point to things that otherwise they would never be able to do. And I feel that same way about psychological language, talking about relationships and so on, is not always helpful to people. Sometimes it's very disruptive, but it does give people permission in a way to talk about things that because they're living in a, whatever, a Confucian society or a very hierarchical society of some other kind or whatever they're not, you know, or this is a woman's lot, you're living in a society where there's a, a very clearly defined gender role and there's just no space for you to begin that this kind of discourse, even if it's destabilizing and problematic in some ways, opens up the possibility of another kind of conversation and imagining another kind of situation for people. So I think we need both. I think I think as as helpers and even as again as researchers trying to build models, we need both ideas. And for me, the 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 corrective always is to think in terms of trade offs, not to assume that there's one way that's going to work for everything, uh, but assume that this works in certain ways. But what's the cost? What's what are the implications of this? You know, in, in on both sides of the ledger, kind of if you will. Anyway, that's I get to do my. As a concluding thought to throw out there, I'd like to suggest that perhaps globally, the pendulum has not yet swung that far in terms of the McDonaldization of the concept of trauma. Uh, from my own current cynical perspective, I'm sure I'll change my mind tomorrow. Uh, it, it, it may be that the, the, the fashionable discourse of trauma is still mostly operating in spaces of relative privilege. Uh, so elite Western universities, uh, the elite media, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and that it has in those spaces, by many accounts, by non-Western industrial educated accounts, it has been uh, inflated to rather grotesque levels. Uh, it is itself causing harm. Whereas there are many parts of the world where ongoing injustices are still going on and ought to be recognized and named for, for the pain that is, that is you know, being silenced. Now, as, as this, this sort of... Uh, global Western apparatus of trauma trickles down to less privileged spaces, what will be the consequences? Who knows? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with you that there is that problem and it may be large, but the only thing I would caution is that it's not the case that wealthy privileged societies don't have violence and trauma. And uh, in fact, we have enormous amounts of it, enormous amounts that are not talked about still. So again, both things are going on at the same time. That, that there are people maybe who are using the language of trauma to amplify problems and, to feel, and end up feeling more vulnerable than they maybe need to be in a certain situation because they're assuming that that's, that's what all this, the only way this can go for, for them or for other people. And there are other people who are still struggling, you know, with extremes of violence, you know, physical, psychological, whatever, and, and trying to survive. So that's why I would always be extremely cautious about you know, you can make the social critique and it's a real phenomenon. Again, that's what happens in the empire of trauma. It happens in many other people. But keep in mind always that there's a sizable number, a surprisingly large number. This was the whole thing in the 60s, discovering the levels of child abuse, of physical, severe child abuse, which happened in pediatrics first. And, you know, Ian Hacking writes about this in, in uh, you know, rewriting the soul. The point is, yes, there was an exaggeration of this. There were witch hunts and wacky stuff that went on. But there's a core of very serious stuff which still occurs on a daily basis in, in any hospital emergency room and so on, which is very alarming and very concerning. And that, that's part of the 
the reason why we can't dispense with these notions either. It's not like, okay, this is a bad idea. Let's find, let's just talk about resilience, you know, because this is just taking us in the wrong direction. To be continued, yes? Okay. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Sunina. This is really, really... That was, that was really wonderful. Thank you. We really look forward to the book. Yeah, well, th thank you to all of you. And thank you to Samuel and Lawrence. Um, yep. And hopefully after the book does well, you can maybe even write a novel about this, perhaps. <laughs>